welcome to another Chew and Chat. I am Justine Dorn, and this is Ron Rayfield, and this is some fine eating we're about to dive into. Oh my gosh! And we also have another guest here, our new tree. Mr. Pine. Mr. Pine. We've officially named him that. We tried to put a top hat on top of him, but it went like that. So Ooh. just imagine it's there, Mr. Pine. <laughs> <laughs> so we have here today, we have apples. We have gingerbread, which we just made. We have a whole lot of mixed nuts. A lot of these are local nuts, actually. Mm -hmm. We have cheese, we have milk, and the cranberries are still on the table because we're gonna think, oh, maybe later on in the Chew Chat, we'll just try what raw cranberries taste like. I think it'll be horrible. Be really sour. Very sour, but we'll just try it out. <laughs> so, we're just gonna eat right yeah. off of this. We don't have our own plates. The last time you seen us, we weren't eating too healthy. We were eating no. those cupcakes. No, we weren't eating too healthy, but this is pretty healthy food, I'd say. Want some milk? I would love some milk. From our reproduction Jamestown glass pitcher. Yeah, from the 17th century. From the 17th century. It's really might, nice. Might even be the 16th century. Really? Yeah. I think that one is from the 16th century. Either way, it's beautiful. It's but it, it stayed popular until 1830, though. Did you notice that's a heart? No, I didn't notice that's, that's a, heart. a heart. I think oh, they can see that. I did not notice that. Yeah, they had a colored glass back then. Blue was real popular and green popular mm -hmm. as well. I think they even had purple and red. <laughs> I think they did. Now, what kind of nuts we got here? So, we got some walnuts, we got some pecans, we got some acorns. We're not about to eat acorns, are we? I'll eat one. I don't think I've ever actually ate an acorn. Uh, I don't know. Acorns? Aren't those toxic when they're raw? Are they? Aren't they? Can't you get acorn toxicity? <laughs> Isn't that what kills? We're gonna find out. Oh my gosh. Because <laughs> if cows eat acorns, they'll die. Well, I think they ate too much and they die. Our uh, future neighbor, who's happened, his name happens mm. to be Ron, recently lost a calf because it ate a whole bunch of acorns and it just imploded itself and it died. There's a toxin in acorns if eaten raw. So they were not commonly eaten back then, nor are they now. One piece? Oh, sure. We'll, we'll go down this road together. We'll go down this road <laughs> together. There we go. <laughs> that's not an acorn, that's a hazelnut. Is it? Oh. <laughs> Well, it was a little more brown. I thought it was an acorn. It's a hazelnut. They wouldn't sell acorns in the store because they're toxic. I have tried cyanide before. Why? <laughs> so if you eat, don't do this at home, seriously, but if you eat the seed of an, I think it's an apricot. I think it was an apricot, but also it exists in the seeds of apples and uh, peaches. But if you eat it, there's little tiny, tiny amounts of naturally occurring cyanide in those pits and those seeds. So, but if you just eat one or two, it's not going to do anything to you. Someone gave me one. I was like, here, try it. It has cyanide in it. And I said, oh, that sounds great. So I ate it. And it does taste like cyanide. Now, what does cyanide taste like? It tastes like bitter almonds. Mm. It tastes like almonds. I wouldn't know. But bitter. <laughs> That's a crazy story. Yeah, but if you just eat one um, or two of them, it won't hurt you, obviously. You'd have to eat, I don't even know, like maybe fill this whole thing up with them for it to concentrate that much. <laughs> but hey, it's December now. It is technically December now. This is the first week of December. Yeah. We had a, a Christmas parade over the weekend in St. Genevieve, and we had a <clears throat> couple of our new members come to the militia, and they were part of the parade, and did some drumming for us, and yes. it was a it was a good time. That was a very very good day. My very first day in the Christmas parade in St. John. Well, I'll go ahead and address the uh, elephant in the room, or I should say the cat in the room. We got a cat. We have a cat. <laughs> yep. So this past weekend we were doing uh, photos for Santa, and uh, 
there was this stray cat that's hanging around Candy's mm. shop and mm. she kept crossing the road, coming over and letting us pet her and all the kids were picking her up and mm -hmm. she was super friendly, very underweight and really thin looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few times she almost got hit by a car. And uh, so Justine and Candy and Dale, which is Candy's husband, the river rat Dale, um, they, they were in my truck. <laughs> and then they came over and said, hey, there's a, we put the cat in your truck. And I'm thinking, what? Okay, let me, let me say what happened. So we were out taking pictures <clears throat> for the Santa Claus event. And we were at Sassafras Creek Originals. That's my friend Candy's store. Across from the store, there's a big cornfield. St. Jen is actually a farming town. So out of this cornfield emerges this emaciated black cat. I mean, I could feel every single bone in her body. She was half starved, the poor thing. Mm -hmm. And she came over to us and she would not leave. She was just hanging around for two hours before I finally decided that I want to adopt this cat. She was needing some help. Yeah, she needed some help, you know. Plus it's so, so cold. This winter's been really cold. Like the nights have been getting down to the 20s and the teens Fahrenheit. So I can't even, Im I can't even imagine um, just sleeping outside in that, especially when it's rainy and snowy and icy. Mm -hmm. So after two hours and this cat would not leave, she just kept wandering Meow. around me Meow. and she was meowing very loudly. And all the kids that came by for the photo event were picking her up and she was super, super friendly. And the kids were saying, I want her, I want her. But of course the parents said, we don't got room for a cat, put her down. And this probably happened with like 10 different families. Yeah. And finally for two hours, I said, Ron, I'm gonna get this cat. Cause I felt how skinny she was. Like her pelvic bones were sticking out. I didn't think she was serious, but it turns out she was, it was in my truck. Yeah, <laughs> so first, so here's the thing. We did not come there that day thinking that we were gonna leave with an animal. We didn't have an animal carrier with us. So I found a big, big cardboard box, one this big. I poked a whole bunch of holes in it so she could breathe and I put her in the box and I closed it and I taped the top up really, really good and I put it in our truck. Literally two minutes later, she she came out of the box. She just poked her head out through the tape and everything, so that didn't work. Um, but she wasn't stressed at all. Like She came out of the box and just said, meow, hi. <laughs> yeah. Haven't seen you guys in a while. And it was warm in there because it was mm -hmm. it was cold and pretty windy outside, but inside the cab of the vehicle it was, you know, incubating with the sun hitting. Right. It. So she was she took a nap. I checked right. on her. She was sleeping at like one o'clock and I went back over there about three thirty mm -hmm. and she still is in the same spot, just like curled up yeah. in the seat. And yes, we do have a truck. <laughs> it's a big one. It's a Chevy. A nineteen eighty four Chevy. That's right. Four wheel drive. <laughs> with stick shift. With stick shift. <clears throat> but uh so that didn't work i was worried she was gonna poop in the truck so i had to think of something else <laughs> so i found a big plastic tub like the thing you store extra christmas decorations in mm -hmm. and we put her in that we drilled a whole bunch of holes in it and it has the snap clips on the side so i thought there's no way she's getting out of this mm -hmm. she got out of it it took her just as long. It took her probably one to two minutes and she broke out of it. She's a smart kid. She's really smart. And again, she wasn't stressed. She just came out and was like, hi, meow. She still wanted to be petted and everything. So I said, let's just keep her in the truck. I'm sorry, I don't know what to say. So we kept her in the truck um, until the rest of the photo event was over. And we drove her back home. Well, first we, we uh, got cat food and cat treats, all that awesome stuff. She is the nicest cat ever. I mean, super sweet. First of all, she didn't pee or poop in the truck, which already is huge points. And yeah. <laughs> secondly, the whole time we were driving, she wasn't scared at all. She was just cuddling up next to us. She really loves cuddling. She really, really does. So we took her home that night. The poor cat was starving to death. I mean, as soon as we put the plate of food down, she freaked out. <laughs> she ran to it and she just gobbled it up. We had to give it to her slowly, a little bit at a time, so that she wouldn't puke from eating so fast. But I swear, we've only had her for three days and she already looks like she's gained a lot of weight. Yeah. She already looks so much better. Mm -hmm. And when we got her, she was covered in kind of like this white dandruff and you could just tell she had a hard time. Yeah, she's, she's a young cat too. I think she is. I think she might be uh, between six to 10 months old. 
We think she's a girl. I don't think it that... Is. Yeah, it's a girl. And we, she hasn't been um, neutered because she has that smell to her. She has kind of a musky pheromone smell that I don't get from any of my shelter cats that I've had in the past. I've been fixed. And we looked all through the uh, St. Genevieve um, Facebook group because people post their missing animals there. Mm -hmm. And I went back and I looked like over a week and there isn't any posts about a missing black cat or any cat really. And so I th we think that she is either a stray or she was dumped. Which unfortunately happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there are a lot of stray cats in the town that people will just feed. They'll leave out food bowls for them and they just go around. But they're still wild cats. Uh, they don't have a home. People just feel sorry for them and so they leave out food every so often. But with winter coming up, that's not really nice. If you can have a home for them and they're right. nice cats, take them in. So where is she right now? She's actually asleep on the other side of the room. Yeah, she's sleeping by the wood stove. Yeah, she's sleeping by the wood stove. And she hasn't messed with our tree at all. She is so well-mannered. It's incredible. I know. I see horror stories about people with cats and their right. Christmas trees. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, this one isn't <laughs> interested in our tree at all. She's only interested in us. Eating, sleeping, and getting petted. Yeah, that's all she cares about. But she's so loving. And before somebody says, well, they didn't have cats back then, they did have cats Yeah, they back did. <laughs> even inside the house, even mm -hmm. especially in the kitchen. You know, that's how you keep the rodents down. That's how mm -hmm. we're going to keep our rodents down. You know, big secret, we have an issue with mice sometimes, and she's going to help yeah. us. She's got all all her claws, so she's ready to kill. Mm -hmm. We've caught, I think, three mice. Yeah. Three mice this year. <laughs> so, you might say, hey, <clears throat> Ron's using a modern, what you call it here? Nutcracker. Doohickey. Nutcracker. I am. But, however... <laughs> they have not really changed in like 300 years. It's such a simple device that it's one of those things that just never really changes. The only difference is these have a spring in them because they are modern. The other ones didn't have springs. It was literally just like <laughs> this, uh, you know, two pieces of metal oh. with a hinge and you just crack a nut. Huh. Now those fancy soldier nutcrackers, we found out those are a uh, um, later half of 1800s thing. Hmm. Uh, kind of Victorian, that's why they look like Victorian mm -hmm. soldiers. Right. But uh, in the 18th century and early 19th century, they were really works of art. They were carved pieces of wood. Mm -hmm. It just had this folk art look to Yeah, it. that's the word I should use, I guess. Primitive folk art. Yeah, and then the ones that we're used to seeing now, where it's the soldier in the red and the green with the white beard, that's mm -hmm. more of a Victorian nutcracker. Yeah. And we can't afford either. <laughs> yeah. So we just have this. But you know what you do? You just get two of these and you... Are you serious? Did you really just do that? I did. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> I've never seen anyone do that before. Or you just get you a rock and just... Like caveman. Oh, go, oh, go. Oh. But I've seen a cool mm. one. It looked like a, like a vice. Had like this corkscrew in a handle. Oh yeah. You stick the nut in there and you tighten it down and it cracks it, but that would just take forever. That is so extra and fancy. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson probably owned it or something and just cracked one at a time. One at a time. Or the, or the king of England. <laughs> Let me see if I can crack it in my hand just like he did. Yeah, have to use two. Oh, you do? Yep, because they push against each other. Come on, you can do it. I hear don't it cracking hurt, don't a little hurt yourself. bit. Nope, that ain't, that is not happening. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I'm strong enough to... The, they don't open wide enough. I'm not even strong enough to do this. Don't get your thumb caught in there. No. I've done it, it hurts. Oh. Turn, turn, turn sideways. Use these ridges on the side, and then, yep, yeah, there you go. She did it. I did it. I will say, the way I did it kind of destroyed it. You really got to pick out the... <laughs> pieces but so we got walnuts pecans these are hazelnuts almonds. these are almonds by the way oh almonds yep. i'd like to try 
Which one was it on then? The, the light colored, the blonde ones. Okay. Now the walnuts and the pecans are local because uh, pecan trees, they grow in a really strange zone in the U.S. They kind of just follow the Mississippi River a little bit and then it goes down to the south. Very strange. Yeah, but so there's only this narrow strip where it grows around here, but it grows here really well. So people here are obsessed with pecan anything. We got pecan festivals. Yeah. And the native pecan trees taste so much better than the store-bought variety. It's a different species, like a native pecan. I'm not sure. Hmm. You want some of this? I'm gonna eat that one. Okay. Pig. You must see Justine making these decorations. <laughs> Go really American. Yes. And you can see her rolling these out and stamping them and threading the cranberries and me hanging the apples. I did the apples. Yes. Most of them. So why did I pick a pig? <laughs> why did you? Why did I pick a pig? I actually found on the Colonial Williamsburg website that they had a antique tin cookie cutter. Now it's really hard to date cookie cutters because no one just writes on it from 1872. You know, it's really hard to date them. So the, they dated it between 1800 to 1900. It, there's a really long window there. Um, but there's one that looks just like this. It's a pig. And I just thought it was the cutest thing ever. Such a cute idea. And I feel like a pig around the season anyway, around the holiday from all the food I eat. So I figured I would just put it in there. <laughs> Don't you have a tiny one too? I do. Actually, <laughs> let me show you guys my uh, 10 cookie cutters here. And we got these some candies. In mm -hmm. case you haven't seen her latest video of her and Justine, they're talking about these uh, tiny tin uh, cookie, cookie cutters. cutters. And a lot of these are modeled after real uh, period correct cookie cutters. And they're made in USA. So this is the full grown mama pig and these are the piglets. <laughs> I thought about having uh, the piglets too on the tree, but I thought, oh, that's a little too much. It's just going to be a full on pig tree. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a really cute idea, isn't it? To have a mama pig and little piglets. Yeah. So I have that. I have an acorn, a little tiny acorn cutter. I have a squirrel cookie cutter. Oh, that would have been cute. You're right, I should have used it. A squirrel and an acorn. <laughs> and I have my heart one. <laughs> and this also is in a museum, a replica of this one. And it's dated roughly around the 1820s, like 1825-ish. So this one is again another reproduction. I also have a Florida lease one, but I didn't use it today. Hmm. And it's still in its box. <laughs> I've used it in the past though. Yeah, we have. Well, hey. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. Speaking of hearts, we got a brand new segment here on Frontier Patriot. Oh, we do? We sure do. Oh, what is it? Cause I don't even know. <laughs> what yeah. are you up to? So there's a big dance coming up in February. It's called, oh! <clears throat> it's called the King's Ball here in St. Genevieve. Yes. And we have a good friend, Michael. Michael is a very good friend of ours. He's I been mean, in our videos before. Oh yes, he uh, took a bullet from Blackbeard. Mm -hmm. He's a heck of a drummer. Yep, he's a very good drummer. And he's an excellent cook. Makes the most awesome smoked meat you'd ever eat. Oh before. my gosh, he, it, he is the Gordon Ramsay of meat. Like he's dedicated his whole adult life to perfecting barbecue. He can make any kind of meat dish you can think of and he makes it real good. He makes the best ribs I've ever had. Now you might be saying, come on Ron, land your plane. All right, well he's gonna kill me, but he needs a date. Yeah, we uh, we need to get a date for Michael. Yep. And uh, okay, okay, so. We need somebody between the ages of 30 and 40. Yes, please. Who likes to eat meat, who likes to dance, of course. Someone with old-fashioned morals. Um, someone who lives somewhat locally. You know, like if you're in England, that's cool, but I don't know how it's gonna work out. <laughs> I, mean, unless, I mean, unless you got some miles you wanna burn, but. Right. 
Um, this is strictly playtonic. We're just okay. looking out for the guy. Okay, so Michael is a very, very kind guy. All the ladies out there, I know you're wondering, what is Michael like? He's very kind. He's, he's a he's a hugger. He's like me. Yeah, if you he's want like your Ron. very own Ron, he's, a, he's <laughs> available. I'm not available. No, he's, he's not. He's available. <laughs> yeah, Michael is available. He's very kind. Yep. He is super dedicated to his family. He doesn't have any oh, kids yeah. himself. He's a huge family man. Yeah, but he's a huge family man. Like, he would do anything for his mom. He's just really close with his family. And uh, he's really a really nice down-to-earth guy. And he actually started out as being one of our viewers. Mm -hmm. And we will meet with you guys. We're super open about that. You write us letters, and we will write you back. You want to come visit us, we will hang out with you. We just met Ryan and Aaron uh, last week, and they're yeah. both members of the militia now. And we had a, mm -hmm. a nice couple from um, Jeff City come down this past week yeah. for Santa Fe. And we really appreciate them coming mm -hmm. down. Yeah. So Michael came down because he saw our show, and he wanted to see St. Genevieve. And we are almost like best friends now. We're super, right. super close with him and his whole family. And they only live two hours away, so right. it's not too bad. Right, so he comes by every so often, you know, like uh, once a month or so. Yeah. Yeah, once a month or so. But if you ever had an interest in doing historical things or uh, like try something new, mm. like I said, there's a big dance coming up. Yeah, the King's Ball is coming up. It's an 18th century themed ball, and you can come in normal clothes too if you yeah. want. A lot of people do. I've actually never been to it before. I was going to go last year, but it got snowed out and canceled. And there's an ice storm. It's crazy. But that won't happen this year, so it we need a thank for Michael. Michael has a full-time job. He has a car. Oh, yeah. He's got a nice Jeep. It's a V8. And four wheels yeah. Down. Yep, and he has he has a job. He's got a good job. <laughs> he has a very good job. He's got job. a good job. Yeah, he has a good job. So and and he's very kind. Yep. I'm trying to think what else I can say to like butter this up for any ladies. His mom's a good cook. She cooks a lot of good desserts. He's not married. He's not married. He's not married. <laughs> he is single. Nowadays, it's so hard to find a guy over the age of thirty who's good who isn't married. Yeah. It's so, so hard, you know? And he's really, really honest and down to earth. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we we would like to get a date for Michael. And when is the date of the King's um, Ball, roughly? Is, I think it's the first week of February, which yeah. you can see in this flyer that I'm putting on the screen right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we, we're going to try to get him a date by then. And uh, we'll all meet up with you at the King's Ball. You know who else needs a date? Who? Mr. Jeff. Our he's, landlord? Yeah, he's single. Okay, yeah, <laughs> our landlord. This is a new segment. This is historical dating one-on-one. Matchmaker. Matchmaker. 1820 matchmaker. <laughs> so, Geoff, our landlord, he, uh, he also would like to court a lady. <laughs> And he's very, very open about that. Like, he is actively searching for a lady. He likes good beer. He likes guns, both historic and modern. Mm -hmm. And he likes museums. He's he, a museum director. Yep, he's a, he is the museum director in St. Genevieve. He's an educated man. He has his own house. He loves cats. Oh, yeah, yeah. He loves cats. Um, he's kind of a quiet, like, well... Quiet, but not super, super quiet, but he's not the kind of guy that yells or anything, you know? He's, right. he's well-mannered. He's a professional. He's a professional. He's educated. He loves history. He especially loves uh, World War One and World War Two history. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's healthy. <laughs> yep. He's got all his teeth. I mean... <laughs> yeah, so if we could get a date for Michael... And for Mr. Jeff? Anybody else is single? While we're at it? <laughs> no, I, I can't quite think of it. I can't either. <laughs> what do you think about those uh, gingerbread cookies? They're pretty good. This is from an 1803 receipt. And these actually have no extra added sugar in them besides molasses. Now, I will say when I was rolling these out, I had an, a little nervous breakdown. Because... Okay, you have to roll them out really, really thin, or else they will just crack, 
and the dough is horrible to work with. It's an 1803 receipt. But I figured out if you flour the surface real good and you roll them out thin and you pick it up with a fork that you very carefully work under there. I'm sure a spatula or a butter knife would work as well. And you cook these for only 10 minutes, which is the same with just about any gingerbread, really. Only 10 minutes at 350 degrees, you got some good gingerbread. Hmm. I like it. It's okay. It has caraway seeds in it. Ron don't like caraway seeds. I like caraway seeds. It tastes like <laughs> rye bread to me with that. Hmm. But the ginger bread part taste that I get in it is really good. And the texture is really nice. Hmm. But the caraway seeds aren't my favorite. But those cupcakes last week, those were good. Okay, on to our next topic. Next topic? From the matchmaking segment. And yeah. that topic is Christmas. Oh, yeah. Christmas in America. The history of Christmas and the history of Christmas trees. I know you've been waiting for it the whole video. Here we go. <laughs> and we've touched on this in the last few weeks a few yes. times. So if some of it's repetitive, just bear with us. Yes. Okay, so the time period that we are in is 1820, mm -hmm. the early 1800s. Christmas trees were not the norm yet in America. However, they were very common. Some places more than others, they were extremely common in Pennsylvania, especially because there were a lot of German immigrants in Pennsylvania. And because there were so, wow, that flew. Because there were so many German immigrants that focused just on Pennsylvania, they kind of had a, their own Christmas culture there in this time period, as well as the late 18th century. So for example, it was very common where they would take a Christmas tree and hang it from the ceiling. Like a chandelier. Like a chandelier. Not a full-size Christmas tree, kind of a tiny one, the one that you would just hang or put on a, on a table, like a little tiny one, but they would hang it from the ceiling upside hmm. down Christmas tree. That's kind of a cool idea, actually. And the reason why they did that is because back then they decorated trees with edible things. And they wanted to keep it away from A, the children who would sneak little sweets before Christmas, <laughs> the mice, the bugs, and your pets. So they wanted to keep it all away. Now, all of you out there that have pet cats that do actually attack your Christmas tree, don't you wish you could hang it from the ceiling now? <laughs> it's not a bad idea. Yeah, I swear people back then, they were smarter than we give them credit for. <laughs> Not everyone hung trees from the ceiling, but it's just a really odd thing that kind of emerged in Pennsylvania around the 18th century. When was the earliest date that you found recorded? 1740s? So the earliest known Christmas tree in North America, or in America, uh, United States, it would be the 1740s. Hmm. The 1740s. And, um, uh, I mean, I've come across, like, some historical groups of people that say, uh, yeah, we don't interpret Christmas because we don't think people celebrate Christmas up until the 1850s or so. I beg to differ on that. There are so many eyewitness accounts and even pictures from the time period taken in America. Mm -hmm. When I say pictures, I mean paintings and sketches. Right. That proved that people were celebrating Christmas at this time. It was very isolated, though, to German immigrants. Um, however, not completely so. The French also did it to some extent, and we live in a French area. Now, my ancestry from my dad's side is German up until we get to the 18th century, and then it's Scottish. So my family probably would have celebrated Christmas during this time period. Hmm. But Christmas has a very strange history in the United States. They say that Christmas actually caught on quicker in America than it did in England. They both caught on roughly about the late 18th century. But already by the mid 18th century, a good percentage of Americans were celebrating Christmas. Now, before that, we're talking the 1600s, the 1500s even. It was outlaw, wasn't it? Yes. Um, really strange. But can you believe that Christmas was once illegal in the United States? It was made illegal by the Puritans. In America. 
Yes, uh, in America and in England. So to start with our story, I'm going to start at the very, very beginning here of modern Christmas tra decorating traditions. So Martin Luther, in the year 1536, he was walking through the woods near his home. He looked up and he saw the beautiful night sky with stars glimmering. And among the branches, he saw the night sky and he looked at it and he thought it looked like candles hanging in the pine trees. So that inspired him to take a big fir tree into his house. And he took it into his house on Christmas to remind his children that the beautiful starry heaven was made by God. Well, it caught on really quick because by 1605, Christmas trees were now popping up in people's houses in southern Germany that were decorated. So an anonymous writer in 1605, he recorded that the inhabitants of Strasbourg set up a fir tree in their parlor and they hung from it roses, which they cut out of paper, so they were paper roses. They also hung apples and decorated wafers, gold foil, and sweets from the trees. But that isn't actually the very first appearance of decorated Christmas trees because in medieval Germany around 1500, Germans brought pine trees into their house that they decorated for name day of Adam and Eve, which happened on December 24th. So families would decorate pine trees with apples in honor of Adam and Eve. If you know the story of Adam and Eve from the Old Testament, remember Eve ate the apple? That's why they would decorate the trees with apples. A nickname for these trees was paradise trees because they represented the paradise where Adam and Eve lived. So how in the world did Christmas get banned in America? They probably thought it was pagan. Bring yes. In, bring in nature things mm -hmm. into your house and worshiping. They probably thought they were worshiping them. Yes. Worshiping, worshiping them, but they weren't. <laughs> well, you're worshiping. right. Worshiping. It's a worship. Worshire sauce. But you're right. They People later on um, thought that it was pagan. So everything I just said caught on really, really quickly. In 1649 in England, King Charles I was overthrown. The Puritans, who are now in, in control, they banned Christmas in England. Parliament decreed that December 25th should actually be a day of fasting and humbleness for Englishmen to account for their sins. Now, don't that sound so fun, Ron? <laughs> no, not the fasting part. Right. <laughs> the other part still applies today. You should be humble. Yes, you should be humble. But how many people today on Christmas just stop and think about their sins? Well, usually that's New Year's Day now. You think, okay, I'm going to do the it The day better. after New Year's No more Year's sweets. Day. I'm going to do it right. good. I'm going to do it good this yeah, year. Yeah, you do a point there. <laughs> the Puritans of New England eventually started copying what was going on in Old England. So now we're over the ocean. We're in the United States. In 1659, in Massachusetts, which at the time was called the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it was a criminal offense to publicly celebrate Christmas, and the Puritans declared that whoever shall be found observing any such day as Christmas or the like, either by forbearing of labor, feasting, or any other way, is subject to a five shilling fine. That's just crazy. I know. Isn't it crazy to think that Christmas was once illegal in the United States in Massachusetts? Now, I will say it was only ever illegal in Massachusetts. It, I think most Americans thought it was hilariously outrageous, too, even at the time. <laughs> so it didn't spread. It was just in Massachusetts. It wasn't until 1681 that Christmas was no longer banned in Massachusetts. So from 1659 to 1681, Christmas was outlawed in Massachusetts. However, after that, there was still a lot of public outrage about the holiday. A lot of people thought it was pagan. And if you were found celebrating Christmas, you could have gotten eggs thrown at your house, or you could have even gotten assaulted. 
So when the newly appointed governor, Sir Edmund Andros, he attended a Christmas Day service in Boston in 1686. He was in the church singing and praying hymns on Christmas. He had to have armed guards next to him because there were threats of possible violent protests when people found out that he was celebrating Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> That's hard to believe. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's incredible. It really is incredible. Your research is incredible. I, like a few weeks ago, I said, oh, the, the first, I mean, it was the first documented, mm -hmm. illuminated Christmas tree was in 1781, but I had no idea that mm -hmm. all this was in America, the new world going mm -hmm. on. And it's hard yeah. to find this stuff, but you're really good at it. Well, thank you. Now, I will say Christmas back then... I mean, yeah, still to this day, people get together and they drink. And when you drink, you act like a, a, fool. No, a fool. So back then, people got together and they drank and they acted like fools. And that's what the church did not like. They didn't like it because that would often lead to sexual activity mm -hmm. and just people acting immoral. And we have this idea of people back then being always so stuck up and never committing any sins. And everyone had clothes up to here all the way down to their feet. <laughs> and there was no such thing as kids out of wedlock or everyone had to get married. You know, it actually really was not like that at all. <laughs> like at all. Just as crazy as this thing. It, it was probably just as crazy back then as it is today. And the images that we are inserting about Christmas from the time period are the most PC ones that I could find. All the other ones had women with bare breasts out and mm. people half naked, drunkenly dancing on Christmas Day. Yeah. So, but that's enough. A part of that is a topic for another day about how there's a, a big myth about people's modesty back then that just isn't always 100% true. Um, a lot of people did not go to church back then. They believed in God, but they didn't go to church. And there's just a whole lot of other myths that uh, about how people acted. So all this craziness that was going on, the church hated it. And genuinely honest, like good people hated it too. But still, I do have evidence that Christmas was very commonplace, especially by the late 18th century. Um, so there are several uh, eyewitness testimonies of people celebrating Christmas in America. I have a letter here that was written on January 29th, 1770 by a woman named Anne Little. She lived in Baltimore and she was writing this letter to a friend. I believe there have been a dozen dances since Christmas came in. In this small place, there was one on Twelfth Night. We have had several dances here. You would be surprised to see the number of gentlemen and ladies that attend. At one dance we had in our house, there was about 40 ladies and you may be sure as many or more gentlemen. This place is filled with beauty. The ladies dress expensive, gay, their hair very high, full, and most of them very much powdered. And then I have an eyewit another eyewitness testimony for you from a Presbyterian minister. His name was David McClure, and he wrote this in his diary. Uh, he wrote seven miles to the Stevensons, and he preached. The hearers, they were mostly from Virginia. Several present appeared intoxicated. Christmas and New Year, holy days, are seasons of wild mirth and disorder. So yeah, the minister said that uh, an eyewitness testimony from a minister from the early 1800s saying that people were drunk and there was a lot of disorder. <laughs> Too much, somebody spiked the eggnog, yes. Someone, oh yeah, back then eggnog had alcohol in it. Everything had alcohol in it. I mean, cakes. it still does today, but it had a lot of alcohol. A lot, yeah, a lot of alcohol. It was known as an alcoholic drink, not a holiday drink. Yes. <laughs> So I've been slowly working my way up to our time period. How do we know how people decorated trees back then? Well, trees 
had been for at least 200 years by this point decorated with edible things. That's why they were also they were also often called sugar trees mm -hmm. because they were covered in edible sweet things like fruits and cookies and wafers and dried raisins. So I found something really interesting. Queen Charlotte in England, she actually had a Christmas party that she threw around 1800. In 1800, Queen Charlotte had a Christmas tree and a man who attended the party, he said, and this is his quote, from the branches of which hung bunches of sweetmeats, which back then meant little cakes, almonds and raisins in papers, fruits and toys most tastefully arranged, the whole illuminated by small wax candles. He adds that, after the company had walked around and admired the tree, each child obtained a portion of the sweets it bore together with a toy, and then all returned home quite delighted. So it even had little tiny envelopes on the tree that were filled with dried fruit. Let's go up there and pick one off and eat it. Yeah, just go up there and pick one and eat it. Which one hmm. can I eat? This Run! One? No! Don't eat that! I'm hungry. Ain't no more left. Well, you can go eat this. No. <laughs> so we decided to decorate our tree in the safest way that we know for sure that's how they decorated back then is with gingerbread, with apples, dried fruit, and we tied some little bits of cloth to it. And some pine cones in here too because it's a pine tree. This is a... A white pine tree. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we did not put candles in our tree. For obvious reasons. Yeah, for obvious reasons we didn't do it. That also <laughs> would have probably been a more upper class thing to do because you're wasting candles. Mm -hmm. But also for safety reasons we did not do it. Just imagine it's there, but it's yeah. not really there. <laughs> and no popcorn, that was a Victorian thing. That was a Victorian thing we found out, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. Because it would look really cool. Yeah, it would look really cool. Another thing is I couldn't find any references references of the time of them having stars on top of the tree yet. That was probably a Victorian or Edwardian thing. Right. You know, Christmas wasn't made a federal holiday until the 1870s. Wow. So there's been a long war on Christmas. I think people think that Christmas is just something that's existed for at least a thousand years. But it's a very controversial holiday, actually, in the global history. So if Christmas wasn't the biggest holiday in 1820, what was the biggest holiday of the year? I'm going to guess to say 4th of July. Easter oh. was the biggest holiday, followed by the 4th of July. In America, in about 1820, 1830, those were the two holidays that reigned. Christmas was still <clears throat> celebrated, but it wasn't considered the biggest holiday of the year like it is now for most people. It wasn't commercialized yet. Yep, it wasn't commercialized yet. And that probably took place around mm -hmm. the Civil War time, 1850s, mm -hmm. 1860s, whenever Christmas trees were being sold commercially. Right. Up until then. You had to get your own tree. Yeah, you had to get your own tree. Right, yep. And I do also recall another testimony, I believe it was from the 18th century, of a guy saying that he was going to go with his son to a sawmill and get a Christmas tree. Wow. Yes, so uh, you could have bought trees back then, but it was a big deal. You had to go to the sawmill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people would have just cut it down in their backyard if they could find one that was beautiful enough for it. Like we did. Like we did. Yeah. Now, besides the Christmas tree, how would people have decorated their house for <clears throat> Christmas? Biggest, biggest thing was a mistletoe. I mean, even in England, mistletoes were the thing in England. And in America, too, mistletoes were undoubtedly something you would have found in most people's households, except for Puritans, hmm. around the December season. Also, putting hollies in windows, and that's been practiced since at least the 18th century, the early 18th century, you would have taken a little branch of holly with the red berries on it, you would have stuck some half-melted beeswax on the stem, pressed it on the inside of your window, and decorated your windows, because back then they had multi-pane windows. Mm -hmm. 
So if you had a 12 pane window, there would have been 12 hollies in your window. It's really beautiful. And also they would have hung greenery um, and that goes back really, really far. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because honestly, winter is just dreadfully <clears throat> dreary. There's no color. Yeah, there's no color. So people, for at least the last thousand years, there's been records of people taking greenery from outside to take it inside to make it look more lively. Yeah, it smells good too. It smells yeah. excellent in here. It smells yeah. like pine. It does smell very, very good. Hmm. Hmm. Now, one thing they didn't do, and this is the last thing I'll talk about when it comes to Christmas stuff. They did not hang oranges and apples and other fruit outside. So if you see those uh, Colonial Williamsburg style wreaths where it has greenery but also has dried fruit or also has oranges in it and lemons and whatnot and it's hanging outside or on stair railings, they would not have done that. And that's actually a 1930s invention because Colonial Williamsburg, they wanted to do a Christmas event, but they got together, they had a meeting and they were talking about how they can decorate using natural things that they would have had back then um, to make it look more up to modern standards for more Christmas. More sexy. More sex sexy. Cells. Yeah, because back in the 18th century, like I said, Christmas was not the biggest holiday <clears throat> of the year, so they wouldn't have gone that crazy. But by the 1930s, it was the biggest holiday of the year. So people expected something big. So they got together and they came up with the idea of putting, well, fruits are colorful and greenery, so they started making wreaths. But that is a 20th century invention. You would not have put expensive oranges and lemons outside for birds and squirrels to peck at. You could have put them inside if you were having a nice dinner party or a wedding or a banquet or a dance. You could have put it as a centerpiece on the table. Mm -hmm. But that's about the extent of that. And that's all I got for the history of Christmas in the U.S., y'all. <laughs> pretty good <laughs> thank you thank you very much now you're not getting out of this Ron. i don't want to do it we're gonna we're gonna try what does a raw cranberry taste like is there a pit in it oh that's bad <laughs> <laughs> oh you expect it to be good oh ew mm -mm. i swallowed it <laughs> <laughs> Don't swallow like a pill now, I got you. Oh, that's nasty. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. Now I know what a raw cranberry tastes like. Need more milk. <laughs> All our cheese is gone. Oh, yeah. Hey. Just, just ignore that. <laughs> what happened to our cheese? And the gingerbreads are gone too. The gingerbread's gone too. Well, you went telling stories and I got hungry, so I started eating. <laughs> you know, before we go, the cat the entire time has been on the other side of the room just looking at us. Yeah, she's sleeping. She's so well mannered. Ugh. That taste. Yep. Well, let me go get her. Ron, go get her. I'll go get her. Come here, Judy. She's the most well mannered cat I've ever seen. Oh, there you go. Aww. And I named her Mishmish. The third. <laughs> All my black cats have been named Mishmish. <laughs> it's like a tradition now. And here she is. Here's Mishmish, the third. <laughs> Tell them what Mishmish means. Mishmish means apricot in Aramaic, which is my mom's native language. Mishmish one was my mom's cat when she was a little kid. Mishmish 2 was my last cat, who after owning her for a few years, um, my dad opened up the door to let fireplace smoke out. She was an indoor only cat. She got out in the middle of the night and we never saw her ever again. Hmm. And I was really sad after that. Can you say hi? Say, this this hi. is Mishmish 3rd. Very well mannered cat. Very well mannered. I think she's incredibly grateful that we saved her. And I, she likes being held a lot. You know, some cats don't like it, but this one likes being treated like a baby. And she doesn't lick, she doesn't bite, she doesn't scratch. No. Because who likes getting licked by a cat? It feels like sand <laughs> She has all her claws. And I'm a dog person, personally, but cats are okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> Especially I'm when we got mice person. running around. I'm a cat yeah. person. <laughs> she'll, she'll take care of the mice that are running mm -hmm. around every now and then. But she is so grateful that we saved her. I can just tell. She's really been cuddling up with me. As soon as I walk into the cabin, she's mm -hmm. meow, meow. She comes up to me and she hugs me. Okay. <laughs> Aww. She's purring. <laughs> Anyways, that's the new mascot of uh, early, early American. American. Our rescue cat. Mishmish. Mish. I'm going to take care of Mishmish Mish forever. I love Mishmish. Mish. She's purring. She's purring. She's so happy. I just want to spoil her. Now I see why the ancient Egyptians worshipped you. Because <laughs> you are so worshipable. <laughs> worshipable. Oh, she's in the zone. <laughs> well, thank you guys for watching. We're going to head on out. Take care, we'll and uh, if you're single, hit us up for Michael. <laughs> and Mr. Jeff. Yeah, and Mr. Jeff. Okay, guys, <laughs> take care. We love you. Bye-bye.